So, thank you very much, Dr. Walia, for your kind introduction. <clears throat> it is that time of our conference when it is time to say goodbye until we meet again. But before we do so, I think we can let our hair down. So it is my pleasure to bring to you once again, did you know? Do we relive our lifetimes at the last gasp? This is a question that has interested philosophers, scientists, ordinary individuals for centuries and more. Imagine watching a movie in fast forward, scenes flash past rapidly, memorable scenes from your own life in a matter of seconds. This is a wonderful paper that was published in Frontiers by a group of authors, mainly from the University of Tartu in Estonia. If ever there was a testament to the power of the case report, then believe me, this is it. And don't let the esoteric sounding title fool you. This is one of the most tantalizing pieces of work that at least I have read in recent times. An 87-year-old man was admitted to the hospital after a fall. He had rapid neurological deterioration. He had subdural hematomas on both the sides, more on the left. And he was taken up for decompression. The decompression was performed successfully, as you can see from the CT images, but he deteriorated further, and an electroencephalography showed non-convulsive status epilepticus in the left hemisphere. Let me state in the words of the authors, here we report what is, to our knowledge, the first continuous EEG recording from the human brain in the transition phase to death. We measured 900 seconds of brain activity around the time of death and set a focus to investigate what happened in the 30 seconds before and after the heart stopped beating. Dr. Ajmal Zamar is the principal author of this paper. Because we are not neurologists, Brain oscillations are rhythmic activity in normal brains. The alpha band is involved in cognitive processes by inhibiting irrelevant or disruptive networks. The gamma wave is involved in high cognitive functions like concentration, dreaming, meditation, memory recall, and conscious perception, especially when it is coupled with alpha and other waves. So together, they help us to recall, dream, concentrate. So here is perhaps what happened in the human brain, and dare I say, mind and soul, just prior to and after the last gasp. This is the time of the cardiac arrest. Just prior to and after the cardiac arrest, there was a burst of gamma activity, and very importantly, this was coupled in coherence with the alpha waves. So the implications, let me again state them in the words of the authors. Although our loved ones have their eyes closed and are ready to leave us, their brains may be replaying some of the nicest moments they experienced in their lives. These findings challenge our understanding of when exactly life ends. Through generating oscillations involved in memory retrieval, the brain may be playing a last recall of important events just before we die. If I have made the mood very somber, then let me lighten it. This, Michelangelo's The Last Judgment, on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel is perhaps the pinnacle of human achievement, maybe alongside Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Newton's Principia, Einstein's General Relativity. The old masters, Da Vinci, Raphael, 
Rembrandt and others evoke admiration and awe like almost no others. So here is another, look at it carefully, painted in exquisite detail, dark, foreboding, but also hopeful. I will let you soak it in for a few moments. Painted by none other than mid-journey and artificial intelligence program that turns lines of text into hyper-realistic images. Jason Allen of Colorado entered a few lines of text in this program and lo and behold, it turned out this picture. And what's more, it won the first prize in Colorado's annual art competition and the byline was Jason Allen via Midjourney. So programs like Midjourney use a complex process known as diffusion to turn text into images. You type a series of words into the program and it spits back an image seconds later. The point is that they are built by scraping millions of images from the open web, then teaching algorithms to recognize patterns and relationships within those images and generating new ones in the same style. The backlash, predictably, was fast and furious. Was this picture painted by Jason Allen, or by Midjourney, or by both? Here are some of the comments. We are watching the death of artistry unfold right before our eyes. But this is what Alan had to say in retort. It shouldn't be an indictment of technology itself. The ethics isn't in the technology, it's in the people. And for good measure, he added, this isn't going to stop. Art is dead, dude, it's over. AI won, humans lost. If it is any consolation, the debate between technology and humans is an old one. In the 19th century, painters recoiled at the invention of the camera, which they saw as a debasement of human artistry. Charles Baudelaire memorably called photography art's most mortal enemy. So where do you stand on this? Mathematics is the language God has written the universe in, reported to have been said by no other than Galileo Galilei. I will present to you a simple math problem, but please be forewarned, do not try to solve this particular riddle. You will be tempted, and this is not what I have written, this is from the article that I took this piece from, this problem is simply stated, easily understood, and very inviting. Just pick any number. If the number is even, cut it in half. If it is odd, triple it and add one. Take the new number and repeat this process again and again and again. And I did this, this is my handwriting. You take three, so three times three is nine, you add one, this is 10. 10 is even, so that makes it 5. 5 is odd, so five, 3 times 5 is 15. You add 1, it is 16. 16 is even. The next number is 8. The next is 4. The next is 2. And the next is 1. And once you reach 1, 3 times 1 is 4. 4 again is 2. 2 is 1. And you end in, a, in that endless loop. You try it with 5. You try it with 9. You try it with any number, it'll end at one. This is the Collatz conjecture, named after a German mathematician, Lothar Collatz. And this conjecture is infamous for a reason. It says that if you start with any positive integer, you will always end up in the loop that I just showed you. And I will again quote, you will probably ignore my warning about trying to solve it. 
It seems too simple too, and too orderly to resist understanding. It would be hard to find a mathematician who hasn't played around with this problem. This, on the right, are the orbits of numbers, of relatively smaller numbers, as they inevitably collapse to one. The collapse con conjecture is infamous because every number that has ever been tried ends up in this loop. And all numbers up to 2 raised to the power of 68 have been tried on computers, they always end in 1. But nobody has ever proven that every single number will always end up in this loop. So there is no formal proof, but there is no counterexample. And if you plan to begin to look at a counterexample, please start with 300 quintillion, because everything below that has already been tried. This is a visual map of the Collatz conjecture for numbers up to 100,000 as they inevitably spiral and collapse to one. So these are my thoughts. This is not what I've taken from the article. And on one particular day, I happened to be reading about this conjecture and the Planck's length. And it struck me that visual maps of the conjecture might well represent the physical reality of the universe. Does this map somehow represent the standard cosmological Big Bang model which implies a spatially infinite open universe with a past singularity but an eternal future? And there you see the similarities between the physical and the mathematical. So three steps, plus one forward and half a step backward, will inevitably lead to one, or will it? Staying with mathematics, is geometry a language that only humans know? These are geometric shapes in cave paintings in France, which are 17,000 years old. These are geometric angular shapes drawn by our ancient ancestors, still the Homo sapiens, in caves in South Africa, 73,000 years old. This was published in Nature. And these are again angular geometric shapes drawn not by Homo sapiens, but an even more ancient ancestor, the Homo erectus, half a million years ago. So this brings me to the paper in question, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a while ago. Is a sense for geometry unique to human brains and consciousness? Subjects were shown six polygons and asked to detect the one that was unlike the others. French adults, kindergarten students, as well as rural adults from Namibia who had never read, who, had, who were illiterate, performed wonderfully well with geometric shapes such as the one that I have pointed out here, and the baboons. Well, the baboons, 26 of them, they mastered picking the odd one out when training with non-geometric images such as picking an apple out of slices of watermelon. But their performance collapsed when they were presented with regular geometric polygons completely. The researchers tried to replicate the performance on, of humans and baboons with AI. Convolutional neural networks, which is, a, which is a method of deep learning, successfully matched the baboon's performance, but not the human's. They failed to reproduce the geometric regularity effect. So intuition for geometric shapes may be uniquely hardwired into human brains and consciousness. Artificial intelligence, perhaps, is still missing a deep aspect of intelligence, which is symbol processing the ability to manipulate symbols and abstract concepts as the human brain does. I wish to say to you that you are beautiful, 
I also wish to discuss with you about how to flirt. The man on the screen, in my opinion, is perhaps one of the most magnetic personalities ever. But the man on your right is perhaps the one who's better at flirting. And perhaps I say this with not enough experience, so I will leave it to the judgment of half the audience about this question. In a first meeting between potential romantic partners, there is a need for signaling to convey interest and to present one's mate value as efficiently and effectively as possible. In the competition to achieve the best possible mate, there are many challenges that must be overcome based on the availability of partners and one's own resources. And of course, the challenges are, are enormous, as many of us will readily agree. Flirtation tactics may be non-verbal or verbal, dressing, dancing, posing, so on, and of course, the evergreen, I love you. Flirtation is about what one does, who one is, how one is perceived. And while popular media is rife with flirtation advice, there is substantial lack of level one evidence from serious research on which we should base our recommendations on how to flirt. So this is my well-meaning selection of one such paper on which we can make some actionable recommendations. This was a study to find out what flirtation tactics are perceived as being most efficient in two contexts, for males and for females, for short-term versus long-term mating strategies. The participants were students from one university in Norway and two universities in the US. They were between 18 to 30 years of age, heterosexual and willing to participate. The researchers applied a two by two factorial design the sex of the actor, which is male or female, and the mating context, which was short term versus long term. The survey was administered to participants through a questionnaire. There were four versions of the questionnaire covering 40 different flirtation tactics along with covariates such as sociosexuality, mate value, extraversion, and so on. And the contexts were a woman flirting for short term sex with a man, a woman flirting for long-term relationship with a man, a man flirting for short-term sex with a woman, a man flirting for long-term relationship with a woman. The participants were randomly assigned to one of the four questionnaires, of course, based on their gender. There were 415 participants from Norway with a mean age of about 23 years, 56% of whom were women. There were 577 participants from US with a mean age of about 20 years, 61% of whom were women. And these are the results. For men, what are the best tactics for setting up a short-term fling with a woman? And of course, these are rated by women. So as you can see, that even for short-term liaisons, women, are more cognitively stimulated, making her laugh is right at the top, smiles at her, shows interest in conversations, giggles, gives compliments. And this, these are the tactics for setting up a long-term relationship with a woman, again rated by women. And the cognitive stimulation and the cognitive importance is even more so Making her laugh is again right at the top. Spending time with her, showing interest in conversations, engaging in deep conversations, smiling, and so on, are the most preferred tactics. So why is men's sense of humor rated so highly by women? Humor evolved through mutual mate choice for good genes and good parent traits, but very importantly, a good sense of humor is sexually attractive because it is a very hard to fake signal of intelligence, creativity, and other important cognitive traits. So from personal experience, on several occasions, 
I thought I had fooled her with my gravitas into believing that I was endowed with good intelligence, but alas, my poor sense of humor was almost always a dead giveaway. So for men, these are tactics for a man. How to, share, how to set up a... So as for men, you can see that at least in the short term, men almost never think with their brains. In the long run, some cerebral sense starts seeping into men and you can see that making him laugh, showing interest in conversations, etc., begins to creep in into the, into the consciousness. And of course, I love you is evergreen. So I wonder why our medical curriculum is not more interesting than what it is. How to get rid of the kilos, the paunch and the flab? And all of you will agree that the available choices are rather painful. For such a highly sought after goal, why can't we have a simple injection or a tablet? So, this is a randomized phase three trial, 2,500 participants, a BMI of more than or equal to 30, or a BMI of more than or equal to 27 with a weight-related complication, randomized one is to one is to one is to one, to subcutaneous terzepatide, which is a glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist, so it, it mimics the activity of glucagon, given subcutaneously once a week at three different doses, 5, 10 or 15 milligrams for 72 weeks or placebo. And the end point was weight change from baseline. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about six months ago. And you can see that the GLP-1 inhibitor completely outperformed the placebo with substantial and sustained weight loss. What's more, the lipids were better, blood pressure was lower, and the side effects were not too many, mainly mild gastrointestinal side effects. So these are the conclusions that this drug in three different doses, once a week, provided substantial and sustained reductions in body weight. So perhaps we can have our parathas and eat them too. That's the last piece, and I have overshot my time. Yes, you have. I had, I had saved the time for this, so you can go on. Many a man rocks another man's child and thinks he's rocking his own, for it looks like him. And lest you think that I am inflicting gossip and scandal on this August gathering, this is from one of the most famous case reports of all time. In 1884, a 31-year-old woman came to meet Dr. William Pankost, a very respected doctor in Philadelphia, and the problem was her inability to conceive. The husband was a 41-year-old wealthy merchant whom Dr. Pankost deemed to be of sound body with the exception of a case of gonorrhea a few years earlier. And microscopic examination indicated that his spermatic fluid was absolutely void of spermatozoons. And this is taken from the report. And the few weeks of treatment did not fix the problem. So what did the good doctor do? Instead of disclosing any of this information to the couple, he scheduled another examination for his female patient. And in front of six medical students, Pankost knocked out his patient using chloroform, inseminated her with a rubber syringe, and then packed the, service, the, the cervix with a gauze. Nine months later, the woman gave birth to a healthy boy. The source of the semen was one of the medical students in the room, determined to be the most attractive of the bunch. 
Pankos did not reveal the circumstances of the conception until our after birth and even then only to the husband. This remained a secret for 25 years when one of the six medical students, Addison David Hart, published a letter in the journal The Medical World describing the case. But prior to publishing, he contacted the child by that, by that time, a 25-year-old successful businessman living in New York, and informed him about the details of the conception. So this was the first child ever born through artificial insemination. And here are a few extracts from the actual published report by Dr. David Hard, who was one of the six medical students in the room. At that time, the procedure was so novel, so peculiar in its ethics, that the six young men of the senior class who witnessed the operation were pledged to absolute secrecy. The professor repented of his action and explained the whole matter to the husband after the child was born. And strange as it may seem, the man was delighted with the idea and conspired with the professor in keeping from the lady the actual way by which her impregnation was brought about. These are some of Dr. Hard's thoughts and ideas. From a nature's point of view, the idea of artificial impregnation offers valuable advantages. The mating of human beings must, from the nature of things, be a matter of sentiment alone. And further, marriage is a proposition which is not submitted to good judgment or even common sense as a rule. Artificial impregnation by carefully selected seed alone will solve the problem. Something can be said about the unvarnished expression of thoughts in case reports and other reports of that vintage and in this paper. So, when babies can be created in new ways, they can also be designed in new ways. This is an old story, but an ethical debate that is as relevant as ever. This incident and the paper remains an important case study in not only innovation, but ethics, or rather, the lack of them. So I will end by paying a tribute to the greatest footballer of all time, Thank you very much for attending the YIR until we see you again next year on the third weekend of Jan. Thank you very much for your attention.